the Russian Revolution made history and immediately created myths which would stand the test of time. The October uprising was a proletarian revolution. For the first time, the workers had taken power and were forging new men. The October Revolution was the only the first step to worldwide revolution, a universal model that would free mankind. These two unshakable beliefs form the basis of the faith, maintain enthusiasm, and justify the sacrifice. By the end of the 20s, revolution had failed everywhere, in Germany, Hungary, Italy, and China. The Soviet Union stood alone. Stalin had eliminated his opponents and had decided to build socialism in just one country. build socialism in just one country. In the early 30s, Stalin reversed Bolshevik policy and announced his grand vision. The new policy was greeted enthusiastically by the whole country. The people, the party, and the intelligentsia all felt this was the only way to push Russia forward into the modern world. Stalin intended to build socialism with industrialization and collectivization. The way forward for the second revolution was total collectivization. The method was clear, suppress private ownership and replace it with collective management through modern, mechanized techniques. Eisenstein's camera showed that the peasants could hardly contain their enthusiasm for collectivization. But the truth was different. The Communist Party moved against the small, middle-class landowners. Stalin had decided that the Kulak class should disappear. Arrested, deported, and executed, they did indeed disappear in their hundreds and thousands. The brigades requisitioned land and cattle with brutality. The disruption to agriculture due to this gunpoint collectivization and the slaughter of livestock by the peasants caused the terrible famine which claimed five million victims. But the Holocaust was denied and hidden by the Soviet authorities. Visitors from the West marveled at the transformation of the countryside. Inventors of the organized package tour, the authorities blocked out the number of deaths with production figures. Leader of the French Radical Party, Edouard Herriot, who was escorted around the Ukraine in 1933 at the height of the famine, said, I have crossed the Ukraine and I saw in it a burgeoning garden. Many say that this country is living through hard times. I only saw prosperity. A huge gap opened up between the truth of the tragic massacre of the Kulaks and the lies by the regime of widespread optimism.
Moscow launched the first five-year plan and announced exaggerated figures further contributing to the myth. Industrial production had to reach 136 percent. 2,000 new factories were planned. The plan was instrumental in mobilizing the population for this new industrial war. Socialism was being forged in the red-hot furnaces of Russia. watched the USSR grow into a giant. Communist volunteerism gave way to technical efficiency. Industrialization gave the country a modern infrastructure which turned old-fashioned rural Russia into a urbane society. 30 million peasants left the countryside, the biggest and quickest urbanization in history. These soldiers of industry needed continual encouragement. Communism needed a hero, a hero with a human face, the face of a worker. In the 30s, he came in the shape of a miner. Stakhanov had invented a new method of extracting coal, which smashed previous production records into the ground. He was presented to the whole country as a role model. Stankovism became a new word meaning surpassing in aid of socialism. At the same time, the party promoted thousands of workers to positions of responsibility. These would become the new red intelligentsia, faithful to the regime to which they owed their lives and their consciences. These managers were given material perks in proportion to their level of responsibility. Nice apartments in the newly built workers' towns and the right to buy in special shops, which even in this time of general hardship were filled by the state for the benefit of the nomenclatura, the new favored class. Popular opinion was in favor of the forced industrialization of the country. This allowed the party to rely on a newly formed social class. Contemporary admirers, communist man defied nature. He could move mountains, make rivers flow, take a backward country out of the Middle Ages. It was a triumph of willingness to carry out a policy. The pharaoh-like ambition of communism to leave its mark was edified in enormous works like the Dnieper Dam or the White Sea Baltic Sea Canal. 
These sites symbolize the titanic work of men. The authorities, however, did not hide the fact that most of the workers were Zex, camp prisoners. Propaganda diffused in the West claimed rebirth by hard work. Murderers have heard for the first time the poetry of work, the lyricism of building. When the canal was finally finished, it was named after Stalin, who decided to inaugurate it himself. Man, the word sounds so proud, wrote Gorky after the ceremony. But hundreds of thousands of Zeks had died building the canal. Bolshevik agate prop spoke to the West of communism's merits. In this 1931 film, the French Communist Party shows the benefits of the socialist paradise. Communism had the uncanny knack of transforming history into mythology. The West was in crisis. The tremors from the Wall Street crash were felt across the USA and then in Europe. The depression lined up the jobless and multiplied the bankruptcies. The previously all-conquering capitalism was failing and people in the West started having doubts. Could this be the end of the reign of free enterprise, profit chasing and the all-powerful market? Workers hit by the crisis in the U.S. and Europe had good reason to fight for better conditions. On hunger marches and in industrial action, the communists were on the front line, leading by example, encouraging the troops like Maurice Thorez, head of the French Communist Party. In the face of the collapse of capitalism, the communist militant appeared to be like a man rescued from the curse of profit, generous, arm in arm with his comrades, sure of his destiny. He was the man of the future. Germany was the worst hit by the crisis in Europe. By 1930, there were four million unemployed, and by 1932, six million. 
But it was the Nazis, not the communists, who took advantage of the situation. In despair, large numbers of the young, the jobless, the worried middle classes, and downgraded workers saw Hitler as the answer to their problems. He promised Germany a solution, a Third Reich, revenge for the Treaty of Versailles. This revenge was taken on democracy, the Jews, and the communists. In opposition to the Nazis, the Communist Party continued to develop. But it had to follow a strict sectarian line dictated by Moscow, not to collaborate with social democracy, better known as social fascism. The communists had never forgiven the socialists for their involvement in the assassinations of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Lipknecht, and so attacked first and foremost the social democrats. Social democracy is the most dangerous enemy of the workers' movement, claimed Ernst Thälmann, leader of the German Communist Party. Opposition between the communists and fascists divided the working class, which made up half of the population. But communist short-sightedness meant not joining the anti-fascist popular front, and nothing could stop the rise of the Nazis. Hitler's arrival in power was a tragedy of global proportions and a catastrophe for the German communists. The burning of parliament, the Reichstag, sparked off a reign of terror. Communists were arrested in their thousands and thrown in concentration camps. The party was completely banned. George Dimitrov, General Secretary of the Comintern, was accused of ordering the fire. Before the court in Leipzig, Dimitrov, defending himself, managed to turn the trial into an attack on Hitler. And in the eyes of the world, the Communist Party became the defenders of democracy against the Nazis. Thulmann, the head of the German communists, was thrown in jail and became the symbol of the fight against fascism. Demonstrations for his release were held in London, New York, and Paris. One of the ironies of this century's history is that Hitler's coming to power was a huge contributing factor in the development of anti-fascist fronts in which communists had an important role. Intellectuals, artists and writers were among the first to join the anti-fascist ranks. Through fear of Hitler, Democrats and liberals became involved in a fight whose cause was never in doubt. With anti-fascism, Communism was given a new lease of life. In Paris, on February 6, 1934, the right-wing nationalists demonstrated in front of the French parliament. The extremists tried to storm the building. Fighting went on through the night. By morning, there were eight dead. One week later, in protest of the previous week's rioting, was an event of considerable political importance. Two distinct demonstrations, one socialist, the other communist, converged on the Place de la Nation.
Leon Blum, the socialist leader, rallied his troops. At Place de la Nation, the two groups met up with cries of unity, unity. Grassroots members wanted union. In July 1935, at the 7th Common Turn, things changed. A lesson had been learned from what happened in Germany. Nazism was denounced as the danger against which all democratic forces should unite. Although late, Stalin nonetheless took Hitler seriously long before the West. He knew war with Germany was an eventuality. New foreign policy was announced, and at the common turn, class against class strategy was replaced by the Popular Front. Wilhelm Pick, who replaced Thalmann as head of the German Communist Party, was acclaimed. At the stand, Palmiro Togliatti, leader of the Italian Communists, who was exiled by the fascists, gave his opinion. From then on, there were only two camps, fascism and anti-fascism. In the new polarized order, Hitler was the bad guy and Uncle Joe Stalin, the good guy. Nom de millions de combattants de la révolution proletarienne mondiale, au nom des travailleurs de tous les pays, nous nous adressons à toi, camarade Stalin, notre, notre chef, fidèle continuateur de l'œuvre de Marx, d'Engels et de Lenin, sous ta direction, L'Union soviétique est devenue un puissant rempart de la révolution socialiste, un rempart contre le fascisme et la réaction, un rempart contre la guerre. Le messieurs les bourgeois essayent aujourd'hui de demander au peuple du monde s'ils veulent la paix ou la guerre, le fascisme ou le socialisme. Le peuple du monde ne veulent pas la guerre, ne veulent pas le fascisme. Voilà pourquoi ils se tournent de plus en plus vers l'Union soviétique en fixant sur toi, camarade Staline, Chef des travailleurs du monde entier, un regard plein d'amour et d'espoir. The French communists had a place of honor. Torres, installed as leader by Moscow, explained how the party was extracting itself from the isolation of sectarianism. Pendant un moment, comprenez, camarades, pendant un moment, il arrivait que les ouvriers communistes ne sachent pas comment répondre dans les usines ne sache pas comment se défendre contre tels reproches ou telles accusations. Il était un moment où, en raison du sectarisme et ses champs, il n'avait pas les moyens de répondre. Il n'y avait plus d'harmonie entre eux et la grande masse des ouvriers. Maintenant, ils sont fiers, ils parlent, ils répondent, ils donnent les arguments. On les considère dans les usines. On dit cela sont les communistes. France was the first country where political union was applied. Nous savons que la bataille sera rude, mais nous sommes sûrs de la victoire, et nous ne craignons pas à l'appel de Dimitrov d'affronter les flots tumultueux, car à la barre de notre navire est entre les mains fermes du plus grand des pilotes de notre cher et grand Staline.
French communists spread their message in the suburbs where the working class lived and worked. According to Lenin, the newspaper had to be the mouthpiece of the party. L'Humanité, edited by Cachin, took communist ideology to the housing estates. L'Humanité, on the kitchen table, was part of everyday working class family life. The open policy of the Popular Front was attractive and seductive and early figures showed that the Communist Party was growing. The 1935 local elections were a spectacular success. Marcel Cachin was congratulatory. Nos succès électoraux au mois de mai et de juin dernier ont été important dans toute la France. À Paris d'abord, où le Parti communiste est le premier de tous les partis politiques. Dans la banlieue parisienne, désormais, nous emportons la moitié de tous les mandats contre tous les autres partis réunis. Nous avons ainsi encercler Paris. Les journaux réactionnaires au lendemain de nos récentes élections disaient « Paris est désormais investi par la Sature Rouge ». C'est vrai, camarades, c'est l'investissement du Paris de la bourgeoisie par notre prolétariat de la banlieue. In the red belt of newly conquered workers' communities, the Communist Party established a counterculture with its own ideology, reference points, and way of life. A school, financed by the communist suburb of Alfortville, built a showpiece school and called it October. Children went away to holiday colonies where, like their Russian cousins, they wore the uniform, scarf, and beret of the pioneers. Education, games and shows were all based on commitment. The red constituencies were seen as the Soviets of tomorrow. 1930s communism became a refuge, an identity and a model. In this 1936 film, The People of France, directed by Jean Renoir and produced by the party, an unemployed man is encouraged by the young communists to get his life in order. La vie te semble sans espoir. Camarade, reprends courage. Tu n'es pas seul. Paysan, ouvrier, chômeur, jeunes gens et jeunes filles, fils du peuple, 
Amis, camarades, le, le parti communiste vous appelle. Paysans, ouvriers, chômeurs, jeunes gens et jeunes jeune filles, fils du peuple, amis, camarades, entendez la voix du parti. Venez lutter pour votre cause. Venez prendre la vie en main. N'attendez pas le temps près. Le parti communiste vous appelle à prendre l'avenir en main. Camarades, la vie est à nous. Camarades, venez avec nous. En avant, sous le grand et invincible drapeau de Marx, Engels, Lénine, Staline. En avant, pour le succès du Front populaire, du travail, de la liberté et de la paix. En avant, pour le triomphe de la République française et soviétique. Vive la France forte, libre et heureuse que veulent et que feront les communistes. In the 1936 general election, the French Communist Party doubled its votes and supported the Popular Front led by Leon Blum. A wave of strikes hit the country resulting in benefits for workers such as the 40-hour week and paid holidays. The Communist Party, under Torres, enjoyed such rapid growth, tripling its membership in just a few months, that it outgrew Blum's socialists and became the mainstay of the Popular Front. During this time, the party had the ears of the large part of the French working class. It established power bases on the factory floors in the shape of the United Trade Union, the CGT. The Communist Party had become the party of the workers, at a time when the growing working class was making history. The effects of this period would remain with the left wing for decades. The Communist Party was the embodiment of working class aspirations, the champion of anti-fascism and the model for future society. These three points even made the party attractive beyond the working class. A few months before France, in February 1936, the Popular Front won the Spanish elections. The left-wing government led by the Socialists took power. In July, Spanish Foreign Legion units based in Morocco rose up against the Republican government. Franco's coup failed, but it sparked off a revolution. Armed units of workers' organizations pushed back the army, but they claimed victory too early. The 
military coups set off a wave of social and industrial action. Revolutionary committees sprang up, urging occupation of land and factories. It was not the small, weak Spanish Communist Party which led the revolution, but CNT, Union Anarchists, and the Socialists. In power, the Libertarians stamped their mark on society and the economy. The West cried out against the aid brought to Franco by Hitler and Mussolini. The democracies had decided to be non-interventionist. Stalin hesitated at first, but in view of the huge support given to the Spanish fascists, he finally reacted. In September, the Comintern decided to form the International Brigade. Thousands of combatants enrolled under the anti-fascist banner to fight in the name of freedom and to contribute in brotherhood to internationalism. Communists from all over the world were writing one of the noblest pages of history. The USSR sent arms. In October, Russian ships delivered airplanes, tanks, and machine guns. In Spain, the USSR was facing up to Germany and Italy. In the streets of Madrid, communism went to war with fascism. Soviet intervention in the shape of arms paid for by Spanish gold came with a political price. Control of the Republican camp was given to the communists and the Soviet secret police were allowed a role in the running of the state. Supported by the USSR, the Spanish Communist Party grew from 5,000 members to 300,000 members in just one year. Communists had a double strategy in Spain. 
One was to call for a widespread anti-fascist union, the other to fight the revolutionary left. Catalonia was in the hands of the anarchist movement, which had expropriated factories and collectivized farmland. In May 1937, the communists suppressed anarchists in Barcelona with the help of the Soviet secret services who arrested, imprisoned, and executed. But the civil war within the civil war was covered up so as not to tarnish the romantic image of the struggle against Franco. Never, as much as in Spain, were the two faces of communism so clear, the just combat and the bad cause, comradeship and severe repression. In 1937, the children of Spanish communist combatants were evacuated to Moscow. In the celebrations for the 20th anniversary of the revolution, they were given a hero's welcome in Red Square. Stalin was present, even omnipresent, as the cult of Uncle Joe continued to spread. As the untouchable head of world communism, Stalin decided to liquidate the Bolshevik Old Guard. The old party chiefs, companions of Lenin, who had carried the coffin at his funeral, Zinokiev, Kamenev, Bukharin, and Rykov were branded enemies of the people. Three show trials, the Moscow trials, were staged in order to convince the people that political opposition was tantamount to crime. The old leaders of the revolution felt the full force of Vyshinsky, the public prosecutor. Despite the enormity of the accusations, the communist parties of the world approved of the purges. In France, Torres criticized socialists who had doubts. The trials triggered off an ideological mobilization of unprecedented proportions to reunite the people with their leader, 
spontaneous demonstrations were organized to demand the executions of the accused. Communist parties everywhere held meetings to explain the nature of their treason. The plot and its accompanying theme of the enemy within were used to justify crop failures and industrial delays. The treason of the leaders explained why the people were suffering daily hardships. Communism could only work if there was a scapegoat. The victims of the trials were forced to confess to crimes they had never committed. Their confessions would have an educational value. It was important the accused find their executions just. They had to be accomplices to their own death, forgive the system, and thus prove its infallibility. The Great Terror got underway, and it pounced silently on industrial managers, writers, artists, and military chiefs. Marshal Tukhachevsky, author of the Red Army's modernization, and a true Bolshevik, was condemned to death for spying and treason, and with him, the majority of generals and superior officers. The upper echelon of the Red Army was virtually wiped out. The Great Terror reached a peak in 1937, when 500,000 members of the party disappeared. They were replaced by people coming from the nomenclatura. The Great Terror replaced the old Bolshevik party with a new one that had no memory. The new directors were ready to follow their guide, the pillar of the system to which they owed everything. This generation, symbolized by future First Secretary Khrushchev, would direct the regime until the end. Although the Great Terror singled out party members and the directors of the system, the whole population lived in fear of the dawn raids. The camps, opened by Lenin, were filled by Stalin. The gulags of Siberia continued to expand, fed by a constant flow of exiles and opponents that needed eliminating. In the USSR of the 1930s, the weakness of the industrial infrastructure, the shortage of technology and capital was more than compensated for with the abundance of cheap labor provided by the camps. Soviet concentration camps were more than prisons. They became essential to the system and to the economy. At Stalin's request, this film was made at Vorkuta. Obedient Zeks drilled for oil under the very eyes of the political commissar. Forced labor was even taken into account in budgetary planning. In 1938, there were 8 million Zeks representing 10% of the adult population.
Stalinist Russia turned a blind eye. While thousands died in Siberia, the nomenklatura celebrated the new year in the Kremlin. Nothing could tarnish the myth. At the peak of its worst crimes, communism continued to entrance. In the Soviet Union, the land of the lie, falsification took place on a gargantuan scale. Totalitarianism was wholly dependent on the denial of established fact, on the transformation of lies into truth. Reality was denied the real manufactured. With its own cryptic language, the party imposed this true, every statement issued by itself and its leader. In September 1938, at Munich, the democracies conceded Czechoslovakia to Hitler. This capitulation was the catalyst for war. In November of the same year, Stalin pulled the International Brigade out of Spain. The war against Franco was lost. A farewell parade was held in Barcelona. Committed to the anti-fascist struggle, communist militants could not afford the luxury of doubt. The existence of camps in the USSR was for them unimaginable. To believe it would be to question their whole lives. In those dark times, to criticize Stalin was tantamount to supporting Hitler, Mussolini and Franco. A simplistic argument, but one which was easy to understand given the line of fire drawn between the two camps. In August 1939, the world was astounded by the German-Soviet non-aggression pact. For communist militants, it came as a crushing blow. For years, communism had been the champion of anti-fascism. The handshake between Stalin and Ribbentrop shocked all those that had opposed Hitler under the banner of Moscow. The reversal was too much. At the beginning of 1939, beaten Spanish Republican combatants crossed the Pyrenees into France. France interned most of these refugees with women and children in camps in the southwest of the country. These people, along with the German communists dying in the camps of Dachau or Buchenwald, would have needed to summon all their faith to swallow the glass raised by Stalin to the health of the Fuhrer. <laughs> 